You're listening to the No Labels, No Limits podcast with best-selling author Sarah Box, where you get the inside scoop on the steps action takers and decision makers take to align their purpose to their principles and achieve their goals in business and life. We focus on the mantra, no labels, no limits, no excuses. Each week, you'll hear from remarkable guests who have overcome challenges and obstacles to succeed in the face of adversity. By listening to their stories, you'll get practical tips, tools, and resources you can implement today to bust through your own internalized prisons of worry and doubt. And now, without further ado, please welcome your commanding coach with plenty of chutzpah and heart, Sarah Box. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for downloading this episode of the No Labels, No Limits podcast. As you know, we are a podcast all about shedding limiting labels and beliefs so that we can lead fulfilling, meaningful, and purpose-filled lives. And I appreciate you walking alongside me and all the other listeners on this journey of living without labels or limits, because I believe without a doubt, we are all capable of so much more than we imagined when we let ourselves go out there and live big. So on today's podcast, we are joined by Blair Bryant Nichols, and Blair knows a thing or two about going out there and living big. Let me, But let me tell you a little bit about Blair before we dive in. Blair is the director of stages for Advance Your Reach, and he oversees the stage agency. And that's where he connects entrepreneurs and business owners with stages that will grow their business and he manages its community of meeting planners. That's a lot on one person's plate. So I'm interested to learn how he balances that and looks about his work. Blair also has a deep expertise in developing speakers for corporate events, conferences, and other thought leadership opportunities, including including internal and external communications. So what I found interesting in reading about Blair is when he talked about including internal and external communications as part of thought leadership. I think we can oftentimes be casual in how we communicate internally, and um, we may be missing an opportunity. So I'm looking forward to learning more from Blair about that. And He is also a manager, coach, and consultant. And in that role, he helps diverse individuals and socially driven companies foster new strategies to further develop and enhance their bottom line and brand. So if that wasn't enough, he earned, well, well, (laughs) I do. I mean, some people are going, okay, but give me the creds, give me the creds. So Blair learned his MBA from UCLA Anderson with a specialization in entertainment management and a BA in literature from American University. So I think, Blair, you're kind of the full package of content, (laughs) experience, background. So I just want to formally welcome you to the No Labels, No Limits podcast. Oh, thank you so much, Sarah. And like, I always cringe because I need to shorten the bio, but I, I, I want I want people to get a full picture, of course. So thank you so much for having me and uh, helping, helping draw out my story already. Well, if you hadn't have supplied me some information, I would have been doing it and putting you on the spot right now, because those are all <laughs> the things I'm interested in knowing, like, how did you get where you are? What, what dry drove you there and what keeps you there. But before we go into any of those questions, I do like to ask all of our guests, is there something you do every day that keeps you heading towards your big vision? Yeah. And, you know, I think maybe a few years ago, this wasn't as common, but probably is a lot more common nowadays. But I actually have been uh, meditating every morning. So I use my Muse headband and do the kind of different meditations that they supply. But also, I just like having kind of the sound effects and, and prompts with that. And I've just been trying to increase that daily. And, uh, you know, pre COVID, I had a really good workout routine. And um, then my my gym closed. And so I started to have to kind of, you know, be a little more uh, spontaneous and fit in my workout wherever. But um, where the old gym closed, a new one just opened with an outdoor option. So I just got back into my my early morning workouts too, which is making me feel a lot uh, more relieved so that by the end of the day when I'm exhausted and I don't have to feel guilty about not wanting to work out. Because <laughs> you've already got it done. That's right. That's yeah. right. That's what you got and to do. fresh air. 
that's that's also that's also true and i'm in in los angeles so getting outside is usually not a problem though it is rainy today which is a rarity but that's also one of the things i enjoy having grown up with weather (laughs) it's nice to see any sort of weather in this town yeah so where did you grow up I grew up outside Chicago in oh, yeah. the Northwest suburbs, so we got all the seasons and extreme versions of each. <laughs> I remember I was working in Chicago, this is a number of years ago, and I, I, I grew up in California, and at the time I was living in near California, in Nevada, and I get there and I'm staying with this gal, and she goes, where do you think you're going? I says, I got to go for a walk. I just showered, my hair is wet, and it's freezing cold. I'm used to cold, and she goes, you can't go out, and I go, what do you mean? I've been in this house. And she goes, no, no, Chicago cold is different than cold, you know. And wasn't it so? I mean, I walked out. I was back in about five minutes. I says, okay. <laughs> Your hair's frozen. <laughs> it was exactly. And I had a hat on and everything. She goes, no, you can go later, but you cannot go with any moisture on you at all. Honest, trust me on this. So mm-hmm. um, yes, and California and LA in particular, I do know from talking to um, my clients and friends that this past week, has been wet down south. Um, Mm -hmm. At the same time, we're getting snow up here. So um, weather is good. But let's get back. I want to ask you about what led you to where you are now as director of stages for Advance Your Reach. What's your background? Yeah, well, as you mentioned, I got my BA in literature. And when you're in college and you're an English major, people are like, oh, you're going to be a teacher. And, you know, my mom and my sisters are teachers. So there's certainly nothing wrong with that. But I was always like, no. But I didn't really know what I was going to be. I just knew that's what I wanted to study. I kind of thought I'd be a lawyer at first. And then halfway through college, I, I, you know, even being a voracious reader, I never thought about the industry of publishing. I never thought about how books come to be and what that looks like. Um, So I started out going into publishing and just kind of with that being my intention. Uh, I did some internships. I thought, you know, "Mm, being an editor is probably not for me. Just a lot of solitary reading and, you know, a lot of slogging through. Maybe I'll be a publicist. And so that was kind of my intention. I did the publishing, uh, the Columbia publishing course right out of college. And there was, uh, you know, it's kind of like a model UN for recent grads who want to work in publishing. We did like a mock week of uh, running our own, um, you know, publishing house. And I was a publicity manager. And then I, the faculty member I worked with there had just started as the director of the HarperCollins Speakers Bureau. And he hired me as his assistant. And I didn't know that the speaking industry existed, but it did seem kind of like a hybrid of being an agent and being a publicist and seemed like a good opportunity. And so that's where I got started. HarperCollins was the first publisher to have their own in-house bureau for their authors. Um, So that's where I I first learned about this industry and started out there helping our authors get booked uh, for speaking engagements. And it's been a long road since then. (laughs) Well, I want to ask you something about that, because when I think of authors and writing and having written, that is something that is more solitary, typically, right? So then you're here, you are helping get your authors out there on stages, if you will. What was the shift that they had to make? What, or were most of them going, yeah, put me out there. I'm ready to talk. Or did you have to do a lot of prompting and coaching and guiding of them? Yeah, well, I think at first, you know, I started out in the early 2000s, so people weren't as engaged online with the community. Nowadays, I think even before you get a book published, you, you know, oftentimes already have maybe a fan base and you've already kind of established a rapport and it's become a lot more part of the job. But like you said, before that, authors really, it's like, you know, years maybe, and then it's their baby going into the world, this book. So yeah, sometimes they're really excited about getting out there and speaking about it because you know oftentimes they're academics or people who are used to doing presentations and things like that but other times no they really weren't you know used to having to go out and speak it was just kind of them as a journalist or as a writer just doing that on their own so we did have to you know nudge some people i suppose but my job over the first five years of my career was really kind of selecting which are the topics that the market is going to respond to because anyone could go out and talk about your book you could do a presentation at a school or a library or a museum and there's going to be people who might be interested in hearing about it but not everyone is going to pay for you to come and speak about your book you know that's usually more 
business focused or very topically focused. So, and, and often, you know, it's people who might already have a platform already have some name recognition. So we had to start figuring out like, you know, that, yeah, sure. Everyone can get out there and talk about their book, but who, what are really the ones that are going to be kind of the most applicable to the speaker's market? So that's what I had to kind of learn and develop and, and start to figure out what's going on in the world and what do people really care about and or what are people going to pay to, you know, actually hire someone to come in and talk about. Did that change how you approached your work once you learned like how to think in that frame? Definitely. I mean, it rules out almost, you know, 90 plus percent of fiction writers, um, because unless you already are pretty famous as a fiction writer, you know, there's just not a market um, for for that. And then it and then so you narrow down to the nonfiction titles. And then, yes, you just start to really narrow and narrow on, um, you know, the topics that are of most interest and the people who are going to be kind of like the prominent voices on that topic to be able to promote and that you really feel like are, are going to stand the best chance to be of interest to companies or other organizations that are typically hiring speakers. So it, it doesn't, it, you don't really get to, you know, go after the ones that are most of interest to you. Whereas like an editor, you get to pick the books that you're most excited about, but they all, you know, they have to have an eye to what's going to sell, what's going to be of interest to readers. Um, but again, that's a pretty broad, <laughs> broad audience as opposed to narrowing it down to who's who's going to be most interest to companies or other people, again, who likely would pay um, their their uh, speakers. So I'm going to I'm going to pick your brain just a little bit on that, because I know some of our listeners will be listening from the stage lens, you know, like, how do I get in front of people? But I'm also thinking about people who have ideas that they want to pitch it, for lack of a better word, to someone who would be an influencer for them in much the same way that being in front of a um, on a stage would be. So this is part about your thought process. Oftentimes what I know is people go, I want to be everywhere, right? It's that mm -hmm. narrowing down, but how do they, how do you help folks or how did you shift to be able to say what, how do I learn about what matters to this organization, this corporation, and how do I connect that to what I have in my list of people who could fit that niche? Right. So <clears throat> I'm going to answer your question and then also fast forward to where I'm at today because the market has shifted pretty yep. dramatically. So a lot of, you know, figuring out what the you know customer, so to speak, wants to hear is they tell us they, they come to speakers bureaus because they know what they want someone to speak about or they have kind of a general problem or they have an event and they want someone on sales or marketing or culture or leadership. And, and so those are kind of big categories that the speakers bureaus tend to cater to. And then once learning about their budget and their demographics and that, then they can provide them with a list of potential speakers and they can pick and choose. So speakers bureaus, you know, really cultivate a long list of potential speakers that they can then recommend to these clients. Um, and what I found out is that, you know, that leaves out probably 90 plus percent, again, of the speakers who are actually out there, especially nowadays, especially fast forward 10 plus years and people who couldn't ever build a platform for themselves, have their own websites, have a YouTube channel, have all the social media options that they didn't have before. So you don't need necessarily to have an agency or another platform, even a book to get your ideas out there. Um, now you have all these other options. So what's different about the work I'm doing now is that um, we really serve all these other speakers who wouldn't generally get the attention of a bureau or an agency because maybe they haven't built up enough of that inbound demand. They don't have companies calling them on the regular to come and speak for them, but they have a business, they have you know a, a message and they wanna get it out there in front of the right audience. So our, our service really aligns them with those audiences. So I think what's really great nowadays is that you can figure out you know, what the audience you want to serve and you can find other ways to get out there and connect with, you know, like you said, other influencers who serve that audience and do an Instagram live, a Facebook live, a state, you know, a stage can be anything, any platform where you just get to be able to speak to the audience that might want to learn more about you, might want to get a free gift, might want to buy your course or sign up for your workshop or other places like that. Whereas 
traditionally a lot of the people who are getting paid to speak don't really have anything to sell. You know, they have their day job and they've written a book. And so maybe they'll sell some books and, and all of that. But the people we serve are really looking to scale their business through speaking. And so speaking for them has a higher purpose, a higher purpose of impact and getting people really interested in the kind of work that they do um, as opposed to just providing content and information for a particular event. So we've seen this big shift into people being able to kind of self promote in a lot of different ways, but also just like the big proliferation of all these stages and platforms like podcasts, where you can now get your message out there long before you ever publish a book or long before you know, you've know you got anyone knocking on your door to invite you to speak, whether big or small opportunities. So you talked a little bit about how the work of stages, quote unquote, has evolved some, specifically over the last year. What have you mm -hmm. seen since the pandemic? I mean, yes, we have the platforms, but um, how have you had to change how you work with clients? if you have had to change it. Oh yeah, big time. Well, so we launched our agency last January. So January, 2020, <laughs> <laughs> and boy, did the world change pretty quickly, right? So, you know, we started out with the intention of, of serving both virtual and in-person opportunities, but in March, we just made the hard pivot and said, okay, you know, this is what's happening. The world is going into lockdown. So we're going to focus on virtual stages. And so with our clients, we talked to them about, okay, first of all, how do you translate your topic to what's going on right now? You know, how do we pivot your topic even to make sure that we're really addressing the current marketplace and we're getting ahead of, um, you know, what people are going to want to know about and how you can help. Um, and then we are also looking at, okay, so what are the stage opportunities for you? So podcasts were really the first stop because you can find a podcast. I can find out about you and your awesome show and we can reach out and, and, and suggest speakers. And that that was the, you know, kind of stages that had been established um, in the digital format because a lot of the conferences that we had seen since then in the, you know, the following nine, 10 months started to come, you know, pop up, whereas before digital conferences weren't as popular, digital summits and events, you know, weren't as much of a thing in the speakers bureau world. We were hardly ever booking virtual talks and we were never booking people on podcasts. We were never booking people on free stages. Um, that's also a little difference about our business model, but we just saw how our clients who, you know, wanted you know, who are used to kind of going to a big conference in Vegas or Orlando or Scottsdale, or they're just used to doing a, a small local event with 20 or 30 people um, in, in, you know, a room that they rented somewhere in, in town could now build a huge audience that transcended their local community, that transcended the U.S., uh, by leveraging digital marketing techniques. So we just saw this huge growth in virtual events. Of course, our company pivoted from an in-person event to a virtual event, and we tripled the number of people that we had attend, um, and which also tripled our revenue. So we you know, kind of proved our own concept that digital stages are valuable, that building this audience, that people, you know, there's all sorts of benefits for the speaker. You don't have to get on the road. You don't have to be away from home or your business for long periods of time and uh, you can still make a really big impact in an audience. So a lot of that was all new. And what's exciting is that because virtual events, virtual speaking opportunities weren't really treated as seriously before, now they are. And there's more than ever before. And moving forward, even when we get back to in-person events, there's always going to be these virtual opportunities. And now these are always going to be an option for both meeting planners and speakers. You know, before, if we talked to a meeting planner and said, hey, I'm sorry, that person's not available, they'd move on to the next person. Now, if you really want that person, okay, they're not available to be there in person, but you can have them come in virtually. And that's, we're all going to be used to that. <laughs> you know, it's not going to be as strange of a thing. And yeah, maybe the fee is, is less because you don't have to cover their travel because you don't have to, you know, they don't have to take as much time out of their schedule. But so that's just a benefit. It's a benefit to your event. And we also feel like events are going to be hybrid anyway. There'd be, you know, it'd be crazy for meeting planners not to include a virtual component. Because again, so many people who couldn't afford or because of a disability might not have been able to travel or attend an event now can do so from the comfort of their home. And meetings as they come back to in person in the future 
really need to think about how they leverage technology and, and create both a virtual and an in-person experience, which just increases the number of opportunities for speakers as well. So all of those changes have been kind of a positive, <laughs> you know, from 2020, whereas, you know, initially everyone was just, all of my talks got canceled, all of my revenue just got wiped out overnight, and it was a really scary, you know, um, time for everyone. But those who were quick to adapt and change and say, I can do this, I can get online and I can figure this stuff out, you know, are going to be even more successful in the future because now their portfolio has uh, dramatically increased as well. That and the, the capability, right? Because sometimes if you're thinking, no, I, when I show up in person, I basically have very few moving parts to manage, right? I can control those. When you're doing tech, people can be like, I, I don't want to count on tech. So, um, or it can be intimidating a little bit. So when you work with people, Blair, how do you help them be successful on stages that are now um, virtual, at least at the moment, um, so that they're, because the presentation skills, are they, I'm assuming they're slightly different or may mm -hmm. need to be different because you're not in the room to feel what's going on. Um, so can you talk a little bit about how that has affected how people present or share or come across? Absolutely. Um, I think it is a big shift for a lot of people and it is kind of anxiety inducing to think, you know, if the tech doesn't work, it's my fault. It's not the person in the room and there's no one there to like help you if you don't have someone there with you. But there are so many more opportunities with technology too. So first of all, yes, you have to think differently about how you present. Looking straight into a camera is different than speaking to an audience. When you even look at, you know, speaker reels from before COVID, it's all on stage, presentations you don't have people looking straight to camera but now we're you know creating virtual reels for our clients you know encouraging them to record you know them doing different formats whether it's an interview or you know just them straight to camera so they can demonstrate you know how they present in a different style and the best speakers have created in-home studios like we all have i've got my ring light and my big microphone and you know and i'm not doing you know a ton of uh, keynotes or anything but you know some of the best speakers they've got Got multiple cameras they've got their teleprompter type uh, set up with the iPad that mirrors their talk so they can have some notes so it actually is kind of it, it gives you a little bit more of a safety net yep. you know there's confidence monitors on stages at times at the bigger events but that's you know no one is there standing at a podium with full teleprompters at a speech. No one wants that. No one wants to pay for that. They don't want that. So the confidence monitor is really more about your PowerPoint slides and stuff like, stuff like that. So there's, you know, a lot of different adjustments that you need to think about for virtual events and you can still do slides. It's easy to share your screen, um, but maybe you don't want to do slides. And, you know, one big thing I notice is that the attention span is less. So most of the talks, they want 20, maybe 30 minutes, as opposed to 45 or 60. Because people sitting at home on their computers are likely to get a little bit more distracted than maybe sitting in an auditorium or a big conference center or something like that. So presentations are usually shorter. And because of that, we want them to be more engaging. So where you might, you, did, you know, had speakers before who were pulling the audience and we saw like new little clickers or people using their phones to do some live polling you know that takes a little bit of time to do in, a, in an in-person experience and it might add some time to the overall presentation but when you're doing it virtually because with zoom or with any platform you can have people do that raise hand function you can have people in the chat and you get to engage with them a lot more everyone has a front row seat you don't have people in the back of the auditorium who are fiddling around on their phones you can have people say you know turn your cameras on and this for this next 30 minutes i really want you to be engaged put in the chat where you're from oh hey debbie i see you you know that's awesome you know you can be a lot more interactive you can bring them into it a little bit easier than you might have even done on stage in person because there's that kind of distance and remove from that so virtual just presents a lot of great opportunities and as you mentioned it there are some challenges with getting used to the technology getting used to some of that functionality and kind of adapting but it really gives you so many more opportunities to engage and get people interested in what you're about like you know in in our world a lot of times there's a call to action at the end of their talk and so and, and online people can click right over and sign up for your free gift your newsletter right away as opposed to in person 
they might do it right away on their phones, but more likely than not, they, they're thinking they're going to do it, and then they might not ever get around to doing it. So even if you're thinking about stages as an opportunity to build customer base, virtual events generally, you get a lot better conversion and a lot better engagement. So all of that to say, like, you, d- you do have to think about them differently. You do have to approach it differently. Um, but it's a great opportunity for speakers because you get to do so much more and get results a lot faster, uh, for sure. And I want to follow up on something you said about the in-home studio and having multiple cameras and stuff. For folks listening and thinking, I can't afford that, you would be surprised how affordable the entry point on all of that is. So if you're someone, this is me doing my no excuses thing, don't count it out. It's not that spendy. You know, you can get good stuff for not a big, huge entry level price point, and you can change later. But um, I think the great thing also, Blair, about what you're talking about, you can engage people differently virtually, is you're right. When you are way back in the back of the room, you can be missed. And it's really easy to be seen or participate in a live Zoom or whatever the platform is. Um, There's an opportunity to be seen and be heard differently than there is just if it's passive and you're receiving per se. So um, when do the folks you work with, um, do you find they're mostly natural speakers who love getting in front of people? Like how do you help them with their confidence? You brought up confidence meters, um, (laughs) you know, like PowerPoints and stuff, but just say someone says, I'm okay, I don't have to have a PowerPoint, but how do you help them want to show up and be them? Right. Well, I, you know, they always used to say like public speaking is the number one fear that people have. Um, and I don't think that has completely been diminished, but so many of us have gotten used to this format, this life, even in meetings now face to face that maybe that's, you know, started to diminish over time. But as a company adventure reach, you know, we, that's one of the services we offer is helping you build your signature talk and helping you tell your story when it comes down to just figuring out kind of a formula. I think you, you really, Realize that it's not maybe as challenging as you thought. You know, you want to connect with an audience emotionally by telling a story to open up. So that's, you know, your opportunity to really get their attention. Then you're going to share your contact and your content, and then you're going to end again with some sort of emotional story so that they, you know, again, feel very connected to you. And, and, you know, that's kind of the very simplest sketch of um, the story braid framework. But I think people just need that opportunity to put their story into kind of a formula and then and know how to best present their content and then you need to practice i think the problem that so many people have is oh well i've presented in meetings or i'm used to doing talks i'm i'm good at that it's it's different you know there's a reason why even amazing professional comedians will do small clubs to work out new material before they go film a new special and i'm talking about like a list comedians not just you know the guy getting started with stand-up there's a reason why musicians and athletes practice and practice and practice it's no different than that if you want to get great at speaking you got to practice at it just like everything else you got to learn kind of the cadence and the way you tell your story and what you want to include and you got to try it out on your family members on your friends on coworkers, wherever you can really get that opportunity and that's the best way to build your confidence you know just like anything else So, you know, I think looking into programs and getting formulas and help and coaching is hugely valuable and can certainly accelerate that. But we always have to remind our clients too, you know, the work is on you. Like we'll help you get on stages. We'll help connect you to that. Um, And podcasts are a great way to get started because you are interviewed. You don't have to worry about 30, 45 minutes of content and it's always going to be the same and I have to have it all perfect. You know, you get an opportunity to figure out like, oh, I liked the way that I told that story. I'm going to start using it that, I'm going to use it that way. Or I'm going to, you know, kind of use what I did on that podcast as part of my big keynote. You know, there's there's a lot of opportunities now to to get experience and to start sharing your message and figuring out, you know, what works and what feels good to you and then what audiences respond to. Okay, so as we kind of come towards the end of this, I want to talk more specifically about the work you do. So, um because we've talked about your company and kind of what you do in general, but Mm -hmm. I want to think about putting myself in the shoes of someone who's listening and they're saying, Hmm, maybe I better connect up with Blair. I think he sounds like who I need to talk to next. 
and really get this under, you know, under under progress so that my 2021 doesn't look like 2020. So say I work with you, what, what could I expect? What is my journey, if you will, with you um, and your company? What does that look like? Sure. So as a company, we have our stage to scale method. So that's everything from creating your signature talk figuring out what you're going to scale beyond this stage with. So as I mentioned, a lot of my experience prior to working with Adventure Reach was just booking paid keynotes. And that's a very small percentage of the stages that are out there and of the speaking opportunities that are out there. So thinking about what can you offer to every audience to get them interested in your product, service, or company, and how they're going to then engage with you afterwards. So figuring out that scaling side of the business is really important. Then you bring in the stage side of it. And the stage side of it is what assets do I need? Okay, I need a bio, I need some video footage, I need a photo and some and a topic, the topic that I've, you know, thought through with some takeaways. And those are the basic things. Obviously, I would encourage you to have a website and, and have that very clear that you're a speaker. And these are the things you speak about. And these are kind of the options to engage with you. Um, so those are all kind of the asset side. And what we teach in one of our workshops is then how to research stages and reach out to the right people so that you can get yourself booked on those stages. And I think this is always the most daunting and labor intensive part of the process. So what our agency does specifically is have an onboarding strategy call with you, talk about the audience you wish to serve, who your ideal customer or audience base is, and then we do the research and reach out for you to those stages. So that's really what we do that I think is so different than what speakers bureaus have done in the past where they kind of serve a corporate client or a booker and say, hey, here's your options of speakers. We do it in reverse and do a proactive uh, service where we say, okay, every month we're gonna research 10 stages that we think are the right audience for you and we're gonna reach out and follow up and follow up until we get an answer. And when they're interested, we're gonna introduce you so that then you guys can just kind of close the deal or book the show or whatever it may look like. Um, so that's what our service does, which you know, when I first learned about it, I was like, Yes, <laughs> this is what the marketplace needs. There's so many speakers who are never going to be served by an agency or by a bureau and are willing to invest in marketing and PR and Facebook ads. Why not invest in a service that allows you to get in front of the right audience more directly than having to go through that whole you know, figuring out Facebook ads and spending all this money on this, that, or the other, you know, we, we, we think stages are the fastest way to grow your business. So we just support you in getting you on the right ones. Well, and that whole piece about you doing the research, right? So it's not a waste of time when you reach out. It's, it's a benefit on both people's side, right? I know for me, we get a lot of people reach out to be on the podcast, but oftentimes my question is, do you know what we talk about on the podcast? Because <laughs> what you want to talk about, there's a misalignment, right? Mm -hmm. And we're thoughtful about it and, and say, what would you propose to speak on and how does it align with our audience and what they want to listen to? So the fact that you already do that research and you're not bombarding people so that when they hear who you're representing's name, they don't go, I'm not talking to that person. <laughs> They're just right. too much trouble. Um, so could you share one or two success stories? In a, can you picture somebody that you've helped get onto stages and what a difference it's made for them? Yeah, we've had a couple people um, in, in the agency and just people that I know and have worked with that A, have made that pivot to virtual building that in-home kind of studio and then how that's just completely opened up new opportunities for them because when people are looking at your footage and they see that you're well lit, you've got a great background and the camera is crisp and clear, that makes a big difference than, you know, the person with their headphones in their AirPods and their, you know, just computer microphone and quality isn't that great. But we had a couple of clients, including a psychiatrist who talks about burnout. And he had been getting on Facebook every day and doing a live video for a few years and um, you know wasn't generating a huge audience but we started to you know get him on podcasts get him in digital summits and so we've been able to like you know dramatically increase his you know email list subscribers and his people that now he can really you know continue to um, not just share wisdom but market to in a way um, that he never really had that reach before other you know had his private clients but now he's got a whole scale where he can actually you know really impact a lot more people than he ever was 
was able to do before. You know, we also have people who are like corporate consultants who, you know, you know, worked with just, you know, a couple clients every year. Um, but based on what they've learned from that now, because they've started to be able to get on stages, they've, you know, noticed how many more people are coming to them and saying, oh, wow, that's so cool what you did for that company. Like, this is our challenge. And, you know, again, that's the scale part of it. You are, as a speaker, if you're a consultant or a coach, your time is finite. You only have so much of it. So being able to scale that with either a digital course, I mean, a book was one way, but we all know that a book is not going to make most people a millionaire. <laughs> so having other products that, you know, there's higher margins on, that there's opportunities to get people maybe enrolled in even higher ticket items um, really makes a big difference when it comes to how are you going to best spend your time and how many people can you really serve and impact. Um, so those are just a couple examples of people that um, I think have been really successful. And we work with a wide variety of different, as you mentioned, entrepreneurs and business owners, um, because they are used to being, you know, the voice and the main driver of their business. But that time is finite. So they need to really figure out how they can use it to the best, um, you know, best maximized <laughs> way. You are speaking to the choir. <laughs> Matt, minimize. Yes, Finite hours, right, for maximum reach and impact. Um, so, Blair, as we wrap this up, will you share how the best way for people to connect with you personally or to take so they can take the next step? I'm going to encourage anybody who's listening to this that says, I think I need to reach out to Blair. Take the word think out and just say, I need to reach out to Blair and then do it before 24 hours pass. Um, so, what is the best way for folks? to connect with you? Uh, so I, I use my full name because I think I'm the only one out there. So you can find me on LinkedIn, Blair Bryant Nichols. Um, Blair like Tony Blair Bryant, like the late great Kobe and Nichols, N-I-C-H-O-L-S. And you can also email me at Blair at adventurereach.com. Would love to chat with you. We can set up time to speak um, further. But I'd also like to give all of you, um, it's a free gift, but I think it's pretty valuable. It's our digital event checklist. So I know as you guys are navigating digital events and what that looks like, like, what should I ask? What do I need to do to prepare? And we talked a little bit about what you need to do during the event, but a lot of, you know, you, you prepare so that you can be great at the event. So you can go to advanceyourreach.com forward slash send hyphen gift. So S-E-N hyphen gift, because we're going to send you a gift. And that's our digital event checklist. You can download it and um, get that right away. And I hope that it's a great tool for you to think about as either you're reaching out for digital events that you want to be a part of and just a way to show how you're really going to think through how to make their event successful, but also as you're getting invited to speak um, at different events, just another uh, checklist to go through to make sure you're the best prepared and can do the best job possible. Blair, thank you so much for being a guest. This has been um, really enlightening. It's super timely. And I think your checklist is going to be a really powerful tool. I'm going to get it just because I like to have those checklists to say, <laughs> oh, man, I should have been asking that a long time ago. Um, so I'm going to go grab that now. And again, folks, please you know, get that for yourself. Cause if it's not something that will benefit you directly, it's going to benefit someone, you know, I promise you it will. So again, thanks for listening to the no labels, no limits podcast, and please help us to continue to share the message um, of getting things done, impacting the world in a positive way and not selling for labels or limits. So share the podcast. We'd love it if you'd give us a rating and review because that's how other folks learn about the podcast and the amazing guests that we have on it. And until next week, that's it. You've been listening to the No Labels, No Limits podcast with best-selling author, change agent, and strategic vision coach, Sarah Box. You can grab the show notes and find out how to work with Sarah at sarahbox.com forward slash no labels, no limits podcast. We'd love this podcast to reach as many people as possible. So please remember to rate, leave a five-star review and share the podcast with someone you think would get value from this conversation. Until next time, keep taking those daily action steps to align your purpose to your principles and achieve your goals in business and life.